Danny Aramayo. And I am Yamin Salib, and I am their advisor. Please go ahead. All right. Uh, thanks for coming out, everyone. Good morning. This is our presentation, Penetration Testing Platform for Automotive Embedded Systems. When we started out this project, we came up with a couple of objectives. Uh, as you can see here, they were to explore vulnerabilities using wireline and wireless access to our target vehicles, and as well as create fully functional vehicle penetration testing platform for educational purposes. This platform includes any software, uh, instructions, or anything like that that you might need in order to uh, recreate what we have done. So uh, we use several car models throughout the uh, project, uh, some for reverse engineering and testing and some for physical use cases. And when I mean physical use cases, I mean the, actionable, the actual actionable results that we came up with. They can actually have some safety issues, which I will talk about in a second. Uh, however, for reverse engineering and testing, we got our hands on a 2008 Hyundai Sonata, a 2014 Subaru Legacy, a 2016 Toyota RAV4, and we used an ECU Sim 5100 car simulator, which I'll dive into later. Um, for the physical case uses, we got our hands on a 2010 Toyota Prius, um, in which we used for wireline and wireless access. And like I said earlier, these can um, rise safety issues. So we have locking and unlocking doors, which we'll show in a demonstration later. This can be potentially harmful as a hacker or a pen tester can unlock a car door from outside of the vehicle and say steal a MacBook from the car. Um, also sounding the horn, which could alarm a driver into driving incorrectly and steering out of the lane. Uh, we also use a 2014 Jeep Grand Cherokee for also wireline and wireless access. And we did things like turning off and on the cruise control, which has some dangerous potential as to people who use cruise control usually don't pay attention as much on the road. And if you just turned it off while they were not paying attention, maybe that could make them kind of steer off the road. Also adjusting the speed of the cruise control. So if you're driving on the highway, say it's a 70 miles per hour limit, we could bump that up to potentially 80 and 90 without you even knowing, um, which obviously has some hazards. And uh, before we get into this whole project, we just like to throw a little disclaimer in there. So all the work performed in this project is solely for the purpose of education and not in any way designed for malicious intent. Um, and some of the vulnerabilities that we uh, exploited, they depend on many factors. Some of the things like the car model, the model year of the car, uh, the packet timing in sense of the injection, which we'll talk about later, uh, the number of packets sent, and just the limitation of tools in general. So, uh the United States is a very vehicle-centric society. Uh, it's the second largest only to China. Um, so, quick show of hands, how many people drove a car today to get here? Everyone in the audience. Um, so, that's a good example, a small sample. Uh, about 263 million registered vehicles in America as of 2015. So, that statistic has only grown since then. A uh, large majority of these models, uh, we can assume, are 2008 or newer, and that is, um, significant because the 2008 model years and newer are all mandatory to use the CAN bus architecture within them. It's a, it's a new standard. So um, how do these things impact society? Uh, there <coughs> are a couple of potential problems with uh, these connected vehicles, uh, one of them being privacy issues. So um, it, a attacker can potentially break into a car uh, remotely and uh, eavesdrop on the in-car conversations by taking advantage of the hands-free microphone that you normally use for talking on the phone using Bluetooth. Uh, this could expose sensitive uh, personal information that you don't want getting out. Um, also, so you could steal a vehicle GPS data that is stored on the head unit of the car that is also connected to the CAN bus to pinpoint the exact location of the car, which is, um, it could be dangerous if someone wants to cause harm. Uh, some safety issues that were exploited um, specifically by Chris Balasek and Charlie Miller, uh, two researchers that performed a Jeep exploit, uh, Jeep hack in a video in 2015, which um, caused a very important recall, which we talk about in the next slide. Uh, they basically demonstrated that they could take advantage or take control of a car uh, through cellular uh, that's miles away and they could change the vehicle speed. I'll alter steering, uh, apply the brakes, turn on air conditioning, turn on the radio, make the radio blast, and then basically disable all physical controls within the car. So you couldn't turn the radio off, you couldn't turn the AC off, uh, they made the wipers go and the, 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 all that stuff. Uh, so that's obviously very dangerous. We don't want that happening to cars on the road. Uh, and then the last thing is trust issues. 
which is basically so the public wants to be able to, to trust the government agencies that are making these regulations that the CAN bus is regulated, it has a strict guideline to make sure that it's secured, and so that these vehicles will not be released in the future with uh, essentially no security safeguards built into them inherently. So a couple of these problems have already come up in real life. As we can see here, in January 2015, uh, BMW was forced to release a patch that would prevent a vulnerability that could allow for 2.2 million of their cars to be hacked into and have their doors remotely unlocked. And also, as Kevin mentioned, the two researchers caused this one. In July 2015, Fiat Chrysler recalled 1.4 million of their vehicles due to a vulnerability discovered by the two researchers that would allow them to control pretty much anything they wanted to within the vehicle. So as cars become inter more and more interconnected, then we also see the rise of the ECUs, which is the electronic control unit. Uh, these are basically just small computers within a car that uh, control things such as engine management, um, security systems, brakes, locks, doors, windows, anything like that. Uh, modern vehicles today have at least 50, usually hundreds of ECUs within them. So with hundreds of ECUs, how are they all going to communicate? Well, this is done through the CAN bus, which is the controller area network bus. Uh, the protocol itself was released in 1986. However, it wasn't made mandatory in all passenger vehicles until 2008 in the United States. Uh, this bus can be accessed via the OBD2 port, which is a port under most uh, steering wheels. Uh, if you go home today, you can probably see it under your steering, work, steering wheel in your car. It's mainly used for diagnostic things, for mechanics to do things like um, work on a car, but we use it for penetration testing. Uh, actually, go back. As you can see here, they, uh, this is a sample um, illustration of a bus topology. Uh, each green uh, circle represents an ECU, as you can see. And the biggest thing here is that every ECU is connected via one single backbone. Therefore, if one ECU is vulnerable, then they're all vulnerable because they all connect through one single backbone via the bus. So that's a little bit, a little bit about the physical structure of the CAN bus. This is more of the actual protocol itself and the packet or message structure. So we start off with the identifier in the arbitration field, which is the CAN ID or PID, which is the parameter ID. Uh, each ECU within the car has an associated CAN ID or PID. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, and then moving forward, we have the RTR bit, which the value is always either zero or one. This only comes into play when there are multiple packets that are being sent with the same CAN ID. So the car needs to know which one uh, it should listen to, if there's two. If the bit is dominant, uh, the value of zero, then that is the packet that will be listened to. And if it is recessive, uh, it'll be a value of one and it will be ignored. Uh, this comes into play because there are two types of packets uh, that usually go across can, the CAN bus. They are action packets and status packets. So the action packets, uh, when they're sent through, they actually contain a change in the state of the ECU, whereas the status packets only describe the state of the ECU. Uh, moving further along, we have the control field, which is basically the DLC, which is the data length content. The, this part just describes how many bytes uh, long the data field is. It's usually somewhere between two and eight for the CAN structure. And then we go into the data field itself, which is the actual messages and values that are either describing or changing the state of the ECUs. And then after that, the CRC fields and delimiter uh, is for checking errors and stuff like that. Um, down here, we have a little representation of the voltage um, that's going into the CAN. There's actually two wires in the CAN bus, the CAN high and the CAN low. Uh, when the, the CAN is resting, the voltage is at a stable 2.5. However, when data is being sent through, the CAN high raises to 5 volts, and the CAN low lowers to 0 volts to balance out the voltage. Uh, this is also done for error detection, so if the CAN high were to rise to five volts, say, and the CAN load didn't lower to zero volts, then the car would know that this signal was just noise and was not an actual uh, signal. And here, we just have a little bit of uh, lo uh, like binary logic between uh, behind what kind of goes on when the packets are being sent. 
Uh, if you're familiar with binary logic, it's just uh, zeros and ones, so this higher level here represents a one, whereas the lower level represents zeros. Uh, here's our first um, penetration test. We did a hardwired test. Basically what we did here is take our laptop or computer uh, running the CANTACT application, which then connects via USB into the CANTACT device or the CANABLE device. The only, they basically do the same job. The only difference is that the ports. Um, and then on the other side, we custom wired the CANABLE into an RS-232 cable, whereas this one has a direct connection to an RS-232, which then connects directly into the OBD2 port. Uh, that cable is um, illustrated up above, as you can see the RS-232 port on the left and the OBD2 on the right. So we, in this one we have a Raspberry Pi with a Pecan 2, uh, Pecan 2 stack and this is the same thing as the Countable and Cantac and it acts the same way. However, the connection type is using an Ethernet to connect from the PC to the Raspberry Pi and the reason why we're using a Raspberry Pi in this case is because later on we're going to make it into a Wi-Fi access, uh, yeah, Wi-Fi access point where we're going to show later on. So this is our fourth hardwired device. It is uh, using the Ecom cable, which is the uh, specific cable used by the researchers Charlie Miller and Chris Velasic. Uh, they actually released an API that was custom written by them that included scripts for a couple of models. Uh, this device is a little bit more powerful than the other ones in terms of sending consecutive packets and the reliability of sending those packets. But as far as hooking it up, it was the same uh, computer, USB, and then this actually has a, a little bit of a weird connector, an EPC. But uh, we overcame that by just hardwiring that into then the RS-232, which then connected to the OBD2 again. As mentioned, as mentioned before, this is the Raspberry Pi, and instead we con uh, we configured it so it became an access point, a Wi-Fi hotspot that most luxury cars have, and we we created a password. Uh, I mean, yeah, uh, authentication method, which is the WPA2, and as we can see, we could remotely access to the Raspberry Pi, which is current, uh, connected to the car. So we also explored a, a means of accessing the car using cellular, um, which is a little bit different than the previous methods. Uh, you start out by running the um, contact application on a PC, and then you will tether a cellular phone to that computer, which basically allows that computer to access the internet through the cellular network which puts you on the network, which is the same network that the car is on, because the car has a vehicle telematics unit, which you, it uses for its Wi-Fi hotspot to get cellular data to the car. So the CAN bus injection packets will be sent to the car through the cell, cell tower, and then it'll be forwarded back to the car. And then this allows the attacker or pen tester to access the car's functions, because the vehicle telematics unit is connected to the CAN bus, which allows you to perform injection techniques and control the different ECUs. So uh, this architecture was designed uh, mainly for educational purposes. So obviously you cannot fit a full-size vehicle inside of a classroom. <clears throat> so here we have the ECU SIM 5100, as you can see below. It's just a benchtop simulator that is designed for the use of uh, OBD devices as well as OBD protocols. So how this one is set up is we have a Linux computer running the CANTACT application with a USB to USB type B with the hardware of the CANTACT with the RS-232 to the OBD2 port. Like I said, this simulates or replicates an actual vehicle. So as Joe mentioned earlier, with the OBD2 port being under the steering wheel, the OBD2 port on the simulator is just right on the back. Uh, and then we also have a, uh, another computer operating on Windows 10 running the ECU SIM Commander software, which essentially just monitors the uh, ECU SIM 5100 and what it outputs. So here's a quick example of the CANTACT <coughs> application itself. Um, it comes with a few different tools. Uh, these are three of the mainly used ones by us. Uh, first here you can see the configuration window, which uh, all you do here is uh, select your device, which for us was the CANTACT device or the CANABLE device. Um, and you also would select your bit rate to match that of the CAN bus or vehicle that you are trying to uh, monitor, monitor or transmit to. Uh, here we see the live window, which shows all of the ECUs. Um, usually there would be a lot more lines, but as you can see here, there's only three. 
We have the ID, as I mentioned earlier, is the CAN ID or the PID, and then the DLC, which represents the length of the data. As you can see, those are all eight, and there's also eight bytes of data. And then also the data itself, which is the actual messages being sent. And the values in red uh, mean that the data has, that particular byte has been changed recently in the last second. So this is a live view, so um, it would be refreshing every like millisecond. And then here we have the transmit window. This is where we can customize and actually send our own packets back into the car. We would write out our own CAN ID, our DLC, and our data, and then hit transmit, and it would send from our computer into the vehicle. So, as uh, Joe was just talking about the many features of this application, we also have the diagnostic window as shown in the top right screen cap. So, on this one, we are just there's a drop down menu with several options. For this test, we are just for this case, we're just using the show current data. So, as this is a very friendly GUI, we just simply click the request button. As you can see on the left hand side, we see the zero one of the request. And you can see the three ECUs that I set up on the bottom left picture as labeled by three CANTAC. You can see the three ECUs responding back to the CANTAC application as uh, denoted by the TX, TX, TX. Also, as you can see, um, as I set up these three ECUs named CANTAC, I use the SOMT command, which is essentially a transmit command that is used to send data from the ECU SIM commander to the simulator, which I said before is monitored by the CANTAC application. And you can see that I send the values of 12, the bytes 12, 23, and 54, as noted by the TX, as it transmits through. On this right-hand side, you can see, as Joe stated earlier, the values have changed in red. You can see the data length content of eight, all eight bytes, and what I put in as the 12, 23, and 54 as the changed values. So, SongCan is similar to a uh, contact app, but it's it's terminal based and it was created by Volkswagen, uh, Volkswagen Research. And basically it's a little more robust, but here are some of the commands that we were able to use, such as the can dump, where we were able to use, and you can see the log file of it being live transmitted. And we have the can sniffer, which is greatly used for the reverse engineering because all the packet or all the communication that are all standard or rather all the same they will get removed and here we can see the can send which is where we inject the packets back into the car uh, this first one is where we uh, uh, lock the door and this is the unlocking of doors as we can see later on in the demo so now we're getting into a bit of our results. Uh, this was test case number one with the 2008 Hyundai Sonata. Uh, we knew we could use this vehicle because it was a 2008 and since the CAN bus was mandatory, it was included in the car. Um, this is a screenshot of the application Wireshark, which is a packet analyzer. Basically takes uh, any message that's going over the network that it's monitoring on and will display them in a pretty neat format. Usually uh, it's by default, uh, sorted by number and time. However, for the case of this screenshot, we sorted by the uh, ID field here. As you can see, all of the 316s are grouped together. And this particular number 316 was the value for the ECU within the Sonata that was responsible for the air conditioning. So what we thought we could, could do here, uh, as you can see, this first byte, it's a 05 for all these packets. That denotes that the air conditioning was turned off. However, when the air conditioning was turned on, the value for that byte changes to 45. So naively, we thought that we could just uh, send in the 45 via our CANTACT app, and that should theoretically uh, turn on the air conditioning. However, uh, after numerous attempts, we found out that that was not the case, and this is what led us to figure out that there are two different types of packets, the status and action packets, as mentioned earlier. Um, these are actually just status packets, which were describing the state of the air conditioning. So when we sent in that 45, we were basically just confusing the car a little bit to think that the state of the ECU was at uh, 45 and that the air conditioning was on. However, we were not actually changing the air conditioning to turn on. In test case number two, uh, we can see the live stream of the ECUs communicating with each other by uh, setting up the can dump command where it just dumps whatever <coughs> communication is happening within a car at any given moment. As you can see, there's 
hundreds of packets going through at any single moment. Um, yep. And in here we can see the can sniffer. Uh, in the can sniffer, it allows to it allows it to, as we mentioned before, to take out all the packets that are similar, and then it only transfers those that are constantly changing. As you can see, there's tons of packets being filtered, and then well, going through, and then it starts filtering out all the ones that are noise, and you can see only the packets that are changing. So for uh, test case number four, this is when we got our hands on the 2014 Jeep Grand Cherokee. So as you can see with this uh, zoomed in screen cap, the middle button right here is to toggle the cruise control on and off. And it says on the dashboard, cruise control ready or cruise control off. The set plus is to increase the speed by an increment of one mile per hour. And the set minus is to just decrease the speed by one mile per hour. So what's actually happening within the car when you press those buttons, is that on uh, CAN ID or PID 571, which is the value that corresponds to the specific ECU that controls the cruise control. <coughs> uh, so what's actually happening is uh, what, we're, what we were uh, mainly focused on is this first byte. These last two were uh, pretty arbitrary and were not uh, needed for this case. But the first byte, when you want to turn the cruise control on or off, the value for this byte would be 40. Um, to increase the speed by one, the value is 04, and to, or to decrease by one mile per hour, the value is 08. However, uh, since these are action packets, for example, say you send in the 40 to turn, in, to turn on the cruise control, uh, the value will not stay at 40. If it were a status packet, it would stay at 40 and say that this is on. However, it's an action packet, so we're sending the 40 to turn it on. However, if it were to stay at 40, then we would never know when it was trying to turn off. So in the resting state, the value is actually at zero, zero. So here's a video of the results. In this video, we'll be manipulating the speed through the cruise control. So as you can see, I'm driving to get up to speed to 25 miles per hour, which is when the actual cruise control lets you control it. And I'm physically pressing the increment button, and then I stop. And then you can hear Kevin's voice saying sending and sending as you pay attention to the miles per hour. Sending. It'll increase. My foot is not on the gas sending. or the brake, which will stop the cruise control. We get to about 35 miles per hour here. Then Kevin cuts it. Off. Cruise control off. And then we de then decrease speed back to the speed limit of 25 miles per hour. And that was that video. <clears throat> and the next one was our uh, wireless attempt. So if you play that, you'll see me driving past Kevin. Kevin's right on the left there and we're on the phone with him. Can I turn it on now? Cruise control ready. And because we have to be in the range of the Raspberry Pi and because Kevin's not running behind the car chasing us, <laughs> we couldn't really manipulate the speed. However, we just did the proof of concept of the wireless uh, manipulation. So, okay. So, most cars, as we mentioned before, that <coughs> there is the Wi-Fi hotspot and uh, well, uh, we try. We're trying to crack into or to get the authentication to get into the Wi-Fi hotspot of a car. So WPA2 stands for Wi-Fi Protected. Uh, yeah, Wi-Fi Protected Access Two. And basically, there's a weakness within it where they do a four-way handshake. And if we could grab those four packets, we're able to crack the password. As we can see over here, we created the password on the car called Raspberry. And over here is the result where we were able to find the password through the authenticating the user. So for test case number six, we used the 2010 Toyota Prius, <coughs> and uh, we'll demonstrate in the video. Get with that. video kind of gives you a, a bit of a background behind the scenes look. Here we are plugging in the uh, OBD2 connector into the OBD2 port <coughs> and uh, booting up the Cantac software, getting the serial port all configured. Here we can see the, uh, the Canable, which is connected to a breadboard and then in turn connected to the RS-232 pins, which is then routed through an OBD2 cable into the, underneath the dashboard.
So this is um, running a script to open up the serial interface that we need to use. to get it in And there. it's in an awkward place. Uh, so here is uh, showing a live feed of CAN dump. That's all the traffic that's going on in the CAN bus right now, all the ECUs broadcasting, all their statuses and actions. Here we are locking and unlocking the doors. Here we show sending a packet using CAN send. You can see that the door unlocks. Pretty immediate. We're sending two different packets, one with an 08 and one with an 04, to lock and unlock. So then we are uh, manually typing in the packet that will activate the horn. And then uh, if you change that 20 to 00. zero. <laughs> So two packets, one to activate the horn, one to deactivate it. And then here we are setting up for the wireless attack. We're showing that the door is locked on the laptop outside of the car. We're executing the packet to unlock the doors. We can unlock the door and then enter. And then here we are just to see if we can do it again, the horn using the wireless architecture. And then turning it off again. So, we also looked at the possibility of using cellular access to remotely access the car. Um, this was particularly interesting to us because it was kind of the reason we got into this project in the first place by watching the video that Chris Balasek and Charlie Miller released uh, in 2015 with the G Pack. Uh, they showed that they could uh, use cellular access to remotely influence the car while the car was driving on the highway uh, miles away from them and they could change uh, a bunch of different ECU functions. They could turn the radio on, like make the wipers go and then actually cut the engine off while he was on the highway. Um, a cellular attack is particularly interesting because the range could be anywhere from several miles to, in, in that case, the entirety of the United States because anywhere on the Sprint network was, was vulnerable to this uh, attack. And um, it requires no previous alteration of the vehicle. So you can scan for vehicles that are in like Ohio or Idaho sitting in here and then remotely access them and then change the ECU functions. 